It's a standing joke that when Irish people go to visit a friend or relative living abroad, they pack their suitcases full of tea bags, crisps and sausages. It's about more than flavors that can't be easily found abroad. There's a strong sense of nostalgia about tastes from home, for those trying to fit into a new culture, while missing family and friends. It's no surprise then, to find that immigrants into this country, also have certain foods that they long for from home. In Ireland, it doesn't help that many of those arriving, find our supermarket fruit and veg, pretty to look at, but lacking much in the way of taste. As these immigrant communities grow, an industry develops around importing foods from their homelands to satisfy this demand. One only has to look at the large number of ethnic shops that have sprung up around Ireland, as the country becomes more multicultural. But, is there truth to the idea that Irish fruit and veg, is bland, and tasteless? It seems that, when it comes to much of what's in our supermarkets, there may be. The seeds are selected and propagated into the fruit and veg because of the size and shape, um, how they produce a very high yield, uh, you know, in tons per hectare, not necessarily because of their taste, you know, so, so it's, it's very much about um, standardization and it's about scale and cost reduction. But when it comes to taste, um, the whole process of, you know, the seed selection and also how fruit and veg are grown. I mean, you're talking about the soil, you're talking about um, if it's grown naturally without chemical uh, fertilizers and pesticides. Um, you're also um, talking about how it's um, picked, sometimes before it's ripe, how it's packed, and how it's transported. And sometimes that can be over very long distances. Ireland comes from a farming tradition. But, when it comes to fruit and veg, we import more than four times what we export. So, is it because we've developed into a society that can't do without its bananas and avocados? In fact, a huge amount of what we import is a lot less exotic. In 2017 for example, Ireland imported a hefty 23,000 tonnes of cabbages, 29,000 tonnes of tomatoes, an eye-watering 47,000 tonnes of onions, and, perhaps hardest of all to swallow, the country that suffered the Great Famine as a result of its dependence on potatoes, imported a whopping 72,000 tonnes of them. What's more, importing foods has an effect on variety and flavour. How bland! so many um, tomatoes and other uh, fruits and veg are because so much has been lost in that kind of supply chain process. So what we do is we narrow things down uh, where we don't have you know, extensive variety of different types because that would only add cost and it adds complexity into a supply chain. Immigrants into Ireland base themselves, most often, in the cities and large towns, so they tend to rely on supermarket food. It's little wonder then, that they turn to produce from their own countries, in a quest for familiar flavours. But research shows that the demand for these imported foods, also spreads into the native population. After all, pizza was not an American invention but arrived with Italian immigrants in the late 19th century. Indeed, Italians are among five non-Irish national communities, that were found to be growing in numbers in Ireland's last census. They were joined by Brazilians, French, Romanians, and Spanish. All of these countries have rich traditions of eating local seasonal and fresh foods. Coincidentally, all of them also speak, what are known as, Romance languages. This is how the Romancing Ireland project got its name. We advertised within the online social media groups of the different communities in Ireland and we asked them to vote for a dish that they felt best represented their country. Then we had someone from each of those countries volunteer to cook that meal, but they could only use Irish produce. So for example, Kika, the Brazilian volunteer, had to cook a carne de sol con manjoca with a dessert called Romeo and Juliet. It's kind of uh, guava, jam and soft cheese. And for the meat, she had to use beef cured in the sun, but obviously in Ireland, that wasn't possible. So she used a strong sea salt from County Louth to do the curing. And then to replace the guava jam, she used strawberries. 
Then the French volunteer Tongui had to make an Irish version of the classic Blanquette de Vaux. And he put with that a potato gratin and a mille foyer dessert. He had to get French wine uh, replaced and he used apple cider vinegar for that. Then because we don't make sugar in Ireland anymore, he had to use honey and he got that in a Dublin garden of all places. Then the Italians voted for a Parmigiana de Melanzani. Ariana the volunteer there went to County Cork and she found a champion mozzarella there. Plus she had a eureka moment when she discovered that we have an Irish cheese that's more than a match for the Italian Parmigiano Reggiano, which is a key ingredient for a lot of Italian dishes. Then we had Utsa, who did the Romanian challenge. She had to replace rice for her sarmale dish and she used spelt berries that she got in County Louth. She also used an Irish apple cider vinegar, both to pickle the cabbage and to make a particular cheese that she needed for the dessert, which was papinashi. Finally, then we had the Spanish volunteer, Mark, and he had to replace jamón serrano for um, a cosido madrileño. He did that by getting a wet cured pork from a rare breed pig in County Wicklow. Then for chorizo, he went to an Irish Argentine who had an ancient family recipe for chorizo and he was making it using Irish produce. So the whole thing proved really successful. And it also proved that Irish food, when it's used with imagination and properly sourced, can really hold its own at the international table. So, why does Irish society, in a land with a long tradition of agriculture, settle for processed foods? We don't like kind of ugly fruit and veg, bruised and battered fruit and veg. Um, we like things to look like the picture. The picture that's in our head and in the colouring books we had when we were kids kind of thing. So a banana should look a certain way, so should an avocado and a tomato. An Italian working on organic farms in Ireland has a theory as to why this is so. Food is very much considered in Italy as a very important uh, part of uh, the day, important part, part of life. In Ireland it's uh, less regarded as important. As, so there's, a, there's less emphasis on food compared to Italy. For example, in my family, yeah, food is considered quite important. So always uh, we eat, uh, we always eat together. When you eat in Italy, you can feel there's more uh, interest in the food itself. So people maybe it's a bit slower. There's a tablecloth always set. Uh, when the family is together, they start eating. Eating is an important part of the day. In Italy. There's a strong organic movement that started um, 10, 15 years ago. Young people left their job to go establish organic farms. This movement is very strong in Italy and so and young people are influencing parents. There is no such thing in Ireland. It's, it's more likely to find old people interested in good food than young people. And my personal opinion is that because Ireland was very poor until a few years ago, where Many people had uh, farms uh, and the pe uh, chickens, uh, so they eat very well until the 1980s, I think. Then when the, the Celtic tiger came, they want, people wanted to forget that kind of world and become more, uh, enjoy the facilities, enjoy the easiness of taking new f food uh, from the supermarkets. So they kind of forgot the, the importance of good food. They see organic food as something not really cool but something old-fashioned. So people hasn't yet realized how much food is important for your well-being. Arguably, neither have people realized how important food is for the well-being of the planet. We do have a food emergency um, and the health of the planet and the health of people is at risk. I mean, if you look at it globally, you know, we have you know, a billion people who are hungry. We have about two billion people who are malnourished and 2 billion people who are overweight or obese. Now, we've only got 8 billion people on the planet, and then you would expect by 2050 that will be 10 billion people. So we have kind of an ep epidemic, and the biggest cause of uh, poor health is actually the diet um, that we eat. Now, when I say it's mostly Western diets of these ultra-processed foods, um, and this is not the case as it would have been in our parents' generation, for example, who would have had more, um, you would say, natural or raw uh, foods that didn't go through many processing steps. 
when we talk about processed foods, it's, it's important to kind of talk about what they are. Um, so, you know, they would be um, something that doesn't look like a food in its natural state. It would have lots of sugar and salt for taste. That would kind of, in a way, mask the natural taste of a food in a natural state. It would also have other preservatives um, that are added through the process. So it, it doesn't actually look, it look, could look very different in a packaged uh, form. Let's say, for example, a processed meal. Um, it will have many ingredients, but it is um, dosed with these um, salts and sugars and other you know, flavors, in a sense, uh, and, and that's all processing. And if we look at the food system overall, I mean, uh, about a third or, or, or even higher in Ireland, 35% of our emissions are directly linked to the way we produce food. Now, that's because most of our food system is actually meat and milk. So uh, we need to change that into a more diverse uh, food model. And we also need to produce things um, that we need in our diets, such as we need more whole grains, we need more pulses and beans, legumes, and we need to be eating uh, more leafy greens, um, you know, fruit and vegetables in its natural state, um, that also are grown through a process of what's called regenerative agriculture. Now that's a term that's become quite a, a buzzword in the food industry. Um, whereas 99% you say of the food that you actually eat um, is actually intensively farmed. It was intensive agriculture where the nutrients in a sense of food are lost along the way. So uh, when it comes back to diet, um, we, in order to, in a sense, have a, a positive impact on the planet, and to reduce uh, the loss of biodiversity and to reduce carbon emissions overall. We, we really need to be eating more um, of fruits and vegetables and try to source those that are grown seasonally and locally and grown in such a way as to promote nutrition. The Romancing Island project has shown that these fresh, seasonal, Quality foods are available in Ireland, if you're prepared to seek them out. There are we found, three main ways to source foods that are full of flavour, and that will benefit both personal health, and the health of the planet. The first of these ways, is to grow your own. As a child, I just, I just had this natural tendency of wanting to try to grow things. I took a cutting of a privet tree bush kind of thing and I, and I grew that in the back garden and it root, the, the roots so easy and, and the th I think when you have success in growing things it just encourages us to carry on and, and I'm into, into salads and stuff like that it's not just a case of lettuce leaves I eat there's lots of other plants that you can eat the leaves of it's like the beetroot leaves it's, uh, carrot leaves I think you can add more variety to your diet growing the different stuff yourself and mixing everything i mean like if you can't you won't be going by oh that's a lettuce that's a lettuce different all different types of lettuce from the shop in this case how long you're going to keep where do you store them i'll take a leaf off that lettuce i'll take a leaf off that lettuce and so they continue staying fresh and it's not stuck in the fridge taking up space you're out in the fresh air you're getting the sun you're getting your vitamin d so um and it's if you if you if you actually help getting your children to help you, they're getting used to learning how to, to do things themselves, appreciating growing things and, and the fruits of it is them harvesting it and realising, well, this is where you, where you actually get the plants from, where, where we get our vegetables from, where we get our fruit from. It isn't everybody who has the time or the green fingers to grow their own fruit and vegetables. However, growing your own doesn't have to mean growing alone. Bayside Community Garden is just one of many such projects, gaining popularity around the country. When people pool their time, labour and knowledge, the benefits are much more than wholesome food for all. This was, I suppose, a, 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 patch, of, a patch of waste ground, for want of a better word. It was just rough grass. There's no road frontage, so it was a bit hidden. Uh, and maybe a bit forgotten and unloved, maybe, if I could put it like that. So um, we identify this as a place that will be really suitable for a community garden. What was happening here beforehand was it, it had become a place where people didn't want to come to. It wasn't very attractive. It was a bit of graffiti, a um, little bit of dumping sometimes, a little bit of antisocial behaviour. Uh, so it took a, a lot of 
hard work to get it up and running initially. Um, but we set up a WhatsApp group and we actually found that really brought people on board. It was a great way of communicating. I think we have 70 or 80 people on that WhatsApp group now. We dug out all the sods, uh, dug out the paths and the, and the middle piece by hand took a lot of, uh, of hard work and a long time. So we, we started digging it out in October 2019. Uh, and then COVID hit a few months later. I remember being over here on my own, say, during the week, uh, digging out the last piece. One thing about this place is it's brought the communities together so much. I mean, we've, we've all met people we probably would never have met, gotten to know people, our neighbors, our friends, and it's been fantastic. The other thing is um, there's people of all ages here. Uh, typically here on a Saturday you get people from their 80s uh, down to toddlers okay and everyone in between so it's really inclusive and the other piece to that is there are a lot of people from different countries uh, involved in this and it really helps them integrate and get to know people and that's fantastic we people from uh, uh, the USA uh, Germany um, Peru uh, Nicaragua uh, and lots of other places. A couple of years ago I started noticing people digging out on a green we have out there called the lamb chop and it seemed to be like a club or something and I always thought that looks great but I didn't want to join in because I didn't know you know did you have to be in the club but one day I discovered no if you're willing to take a spade and stick it in the ground <laughs> you can join in so that was a very happy day for me because I got to know all these people one thing that inspired me was how easy it was to grow things. A girl from Nicaragua was down on her hunkers planting seeds and seed containers for weeks on end. And I did say to her once, God, that's a skill lots of us have lost down on your hunkers. And she went, I have two small children, so <laughs> I'm down here a lot. So anyway, like with no attention, abandoned in the middle of the circle there, these seedlings were growing. So the next thing COVID hit and a friend of mine sent me a packet of runner beans as a present. And uh, here's one of them. So we'd an old uh, wooden swing set in the garden from when our children were young, which was now defunct. It wasn't really safe anymore. But we grew the runner beans up the swing set and uh, they are so prolific. Can I just show you? This is the size they grow to. And you'd get this much every day. I think everybody here it's growing a few things at home. It just kind of catches on. Looking around, a little sweep at the orchard speaks for itself. You know, everybody, it's so friendly. It's so companionable. You're getting air, you're getting exercise. You're doing something lovely that might not be so attractive if you're doing it on your own, you know? So, um, yeah, three cheers for the orchard. Um, one thing that was really good was during COVID, it gave an opportunity for people to come together at a safe distance and still work together, you know, be together and uh, are working towards a common goal. So I think that was really important and people have actually said it, it was really good for their mental health. I think it's a very good community project from that point of view. And that's before we get to the planting and the food and so on. We were really lucky to have Brendan Kearney on board because he knows about plants and he knows about seasonality and all of that. So what he says is it's about always preparing for the next season. So you're always looking ahead. So um, we've been growing uh, some of the usual things, um, I suppose like um, leeks, uh, a lot of herbs, um, potatoes we, we had this year. There are German people who, a uh, few German people come, come here and kohlrabi was something they were interested in so we grew that as well. There was a little debate going on when we were planting the, the potatoes. Uh, we tend to like flowery potatoes. Um, one of our German friends thought this was mush, okay? And they liked that there was a particular variety that they wanted to, to plant to harvest, nice waxy potatoes. So. Uh, I suppose we're all learning this intercultural kind of um, mix and so on, so it's been fantastic from that point of view. We like to eat our, our vegetables, but uh, definitely more aware of um, eating stuff that we might know what it is and learning from people who, who have planted stuff here and saying, try this, try that. And, and, and it's, it's something new that we've added into dinner and getting the kids to see it and getting them to eat it and they love it as well. And, and been able to maybe add a, a, a dressing that someone taught you how to make on top of it. And then show the strawberries and the apples and the, and the berries, are, everyone loves them. So uh, no, definitely has an inf influenced the whole family's diet.
I do have a little brown bin at home and I, and I put all my food waste in it, but I, I, I don't know what happens it or how it, gets, how it decomposes or where it goes. And, and we were lucky enough to, to get a training course uh, from a, a local master composter and he was able to explain exactly what happens and, 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 and what it turns into and how it can happen quite quickly and, and you don't have to wait two years and leave it down the end of your garden it's, and it's something you can use quite quickly and, uh, and to see it reused in, in, in the planting here is, is brilliant and it's free and it's just it, it gets us all very excited because of the, the free and simple nature of it and and we like to go over and, and dig into it and put our hand in and go oh it's warm you know and, and, and it cooks it essentially cooks like a like a little oven and and, and turns into beautiful beautiful compost so it's uh, as i said we've all been educated on uh, how it actually happens here we have lost a connection with where our food comes from so when we go back to this idea of knowledge and education it's no wonder we don't uh, know because we don't know the local farmer that grew it. We don't see the impact in our local community of how it's creating jobs. Um, we're not um, walking through a field and seeing all of these, um, you know, fruits on trees. You know, kids, I've got apples growing in the front garden there and their kids on the road are pointing at the apples as in like, I cannot believe that grows on a tree. You know, it's like, it's just, they're totally gobsmacked. And so that never used to be the case when, you, when you know, most of the food we were dependent on was actually grown in our communities. We had a much simpler diet then, there's no doubt about it. Some people bring their children along, okay, to actually work here. Um, and it, it, it struck me that these children will grow up knowing where food comes from, okay? You don't just go to the shop and buy food, it actually grows in the ground uh, or on a tree or whatever. So they're learning this. There's another woman here who brings um, her little toddler around to, and shows him the fruit, talks to him about it, tastes it and so on. So people are really learning, you know, what about food, which is fantastic. We all know there's a climate crisis. Part of that is food transport. We had some things growing here. Uh, we had like runner beans uh, and some other things that were in the supermarket, in the, on the shelves in the supermarket, coming from places like Africa and places at the same time. So um, it really struck me that if you take an opportunity like this, and if you have the opportunity in your locality to develop something like this, you can be eating food that's grown here, maybe yards from your door, that is on sale in the shop, having traveled thousands of miles. So there's a there's a i think a great realization in that look i think there are great opportunities in doing something like this locally the benefit of it there's so many different benefits as i said health wise physical mental social uh and and um the the whole issue of sustainability as well and knowledge so definitely if there's anyone out there who uh, wants to replicate something like this i'd say give it a go if However, you can neither grow your own, nor grow as a community. The third option for sustainable fresh and tasty food is to buy local. We're a family group, my brother Nicky, his wife Johanna, uh, my sister-in-law Raj, and other wives and husbands. Uh, so basically in 2020 we set Primal Produce up, um, and the emphasis on it I suppose is to grow locally and sell locally uh, to grow sustainably and to have as little mileage on the food as possible and have as much taste as possible our stall is rustic but it's uh, doing very well and we're very happy with with our little setup here we set the stall up earlier on in the year in may roughly uh, for the summer produce and we're, we're still we're still going strong so for the last for three to four months we've had tomatoes uh, which have been doing really well they'll run out we won't have tomatoes until next year so uh, that's part of the seasonality of, of what of the growing system we have we have had all other produce like aubergines courgettes cucumbers and they're also going out of season now for us as well um, but with the help of the glass we can extend the growing season a little bit longer the staple crops, uh, potatoes, carrots, uh, the brassica crops, uh, uh, cauliflowers, broccolis, all that kind of produce, uh, 
we grow in sequentially so we we have small amounts planted and we have small amounts to harvest and hopefully as the demand grows we will plant slightly more each time and sell slightly more each time and so it's just a, a steady conveyor belt of seasonal produce i mean there will be times like we will we won't have tomatoes very soon uh, we're running out of other little produces we have a lot of the broader european community coming to us because they have always had some of the things that were now growing but they could never get fresh so they really enjoy what we have because of the freshness not everybody is fortunate enough to have the equivalent of primal produce on a roadside nearby but farmers markets are growing in popularity in localities across the country I run Irish farmers markets I create markets all, all over Ireland Friday morning here at Wheelands um, markets in Lachlanstown we're basically a producer market so we have um, organic fruit and vegetables we have uh, cheeses Irish cheeses we have uh, good fish um, fantastic bread um, you name it we've got it <laughs> it's um, but it is essentially a producer market it's quite small we have no more than 14 stores in here. It's really about trying to highlight the producers, Irish producers. So uh, we try to keep the food as local as possible. Here we're on the edge of Wicklow. Obviously there's not a lot grown in Dublin, but we do have a, a Dublin grower here from Rush who grows all the own flowers. A lot of the produce will come from Wicklow. So we're as close as we can get. Um, and we do get stuff from Kilkenny and we do bring stuff in. But we, I think you have to call anything that comes in local within a 50 or 60 mile radius because we're a small country. We don't have a big growing, you know, the farmland, the good farmland is in different areas. So we have to take where we can. We don't like the idea of freezing things or cooling things to come somewhere. We like the idea of it being picked the day before. If you look at the organic produce here, the farm is, is, is just outside Bolton Glass and it's literally cut and picked the day before. So it's very, very fresh. In a market like this, we, have the, we have, really have the best. You will see people from a whole range of cultures come in here, a massive range. Because you see, food cultures are very important worldwide. You know, the, we've developed our food culture in the last 20 or 30 years to this level. In other countries, uh, uh, buying food at a market is just a natural way of doing things, you know? So can we Irish renegotiate our relationship with food? Romancing Ireland saw non-Irish nationals discover what this country has to offer when one digs beneath the surface of the commercial food chain. Perhaps it's time for Irish people to rediscover this connection for their own health and for the health of the planet. We expect now to go into a supermarket and to have 10 different varieties of dates, you know, and then we get annoyed when a particular date from a country that we like isn't there. I mean, that's, that's nuts. We have to adjust our expectations. We need to adapt as people and as consumers. And every time that you buy something, you make a choice, you're actually voting at the counter. So are you gonna vote for you know, a more planet positive um, product? We can avoid climate breakdown and social collapse by making an extraordinary effort to um, rewire our economy and make very different choices in how we live and what we eat. DeclanCassidy.com